James Bobin would end up directing the movie, and believe it or not, they somehow convinced Disney to dump $45 million into the Muppets. And that's more money than they'd seen in a long time. And this would end up being the first Muppet theatrical release since 1999. It had been long enough for nostalgia value, something Disney truly loves. The title of the comeback would be completely f***ing stupid. The Muppets. I've often heard the film referred to as Muppets 2011, so I'll call it that since Disney didn't want to subtitle it themselves. A career-breaking problem, you know. Uh, in fact, we've been talking prior to that, for the two years before that, about me becoming a sort of a creative producer with them, working alongside the two executives who I spoke to, um, where I would have been really a part of the day-to-day decision-making on the Muppets. So how did the soft reboot of sorts turn out? Holy sh**! It it's not sh**! It's f***ing great, actually! Not perfect, but it's way better than you'd expect considering the state of the franchise, you know, a generic holiday special 2 type sh**. It's a genuine miracle of a film, the movie being benefited from its brutal honesty, evolving the plot in other aspects. It acknowledges that nobody has given a sh** about the Muppets for the past 20 years or so, with the limited success of the 90s and all the B-movie garbage of the 2000s. And even if it had only been three years since their last project, excluding YouTube videos, with generic holiday special 2, nobody f***ing watched that sh**. For most adult audiences, it was probably the first time they saw these characters for a fat minute, and most kids, it was probably their introduction. Working excellently as an introduction and reintroduction, depending on your age in 2011. Something the characters needed after not being the most viable after the boss's death. This movie fulfills that need. The movie featuring an off-screen breakup of the ensemble as an allegory to their in-real-life decline in popularity, getting the gang back together, and even having Rolf and Scooter at their most prominent roles since Hunt's and Henson's deaths. The story is cliché, but to its advantage, a successful attempt at reviving the storytelling tone and humor of the Muppets in their prime. It actually uses many of the same clichés as generic holiday special, including a corporate villain raising money to save the theater. But it doesn't appear as a rehash because generic holiday special is cliche because it's lazy. Muppets 2011 is purposely simple to benefit the tone of previous beloved projects and expand its general audience appeal. In addition to be a rare instance of great fan service throughout, something I can't say for most franchises, from little things like Gonzo going back to his toilet roots or cameos from obscure Muppets, to the even more obvious recreation of the original Muppet show as the Muppet Telethon. Using the show within a movie in incredibly sparingly, the highlight being the barbershop quartet version of Smells Like Teen Spirit being a transformative cover with a sketch being built around it. Similar how you don't have to know the history of the Muppets to enjoy the Muppet movie, and its comical oversimplification of history, you don't have to understand any of the real-world allegories or fan service to enjoy this movie. The greatest strength of the film is its amount of risk that it takes creatively, including the main characters not really being the Muppets, but new addition Walter and Jason Segal and Amy Adams characters, Gary and Mary. The only disadvantage of its brutal honesty being the ending, which happens in the credits of the film, which was probably just Disney corporate meddling, let's be real. They shouldn't have not gotten their theater back, but at least had the advantage of a dedicated following, even if it wasn't enough, and each other's back together with their new pal Walter. Concluding with optimism rather than victory, could have benefited the slightly ironic nature of the Life's a Happy Song reprise to conclude the film, being more resemblant of the real-world struggles of professional art that Manhattan used so sparingly. In addition to the heart and humor balance that had been missing throughout the 2000s in all the instances of emotional moments failing miserably, this extends to the musical numbers. Some songs like Me Party and the villain song Let's Talk About Me just outright suck, but the good ones are really good. They were written by the musical comedy duo the Flight of the Concords, an advantage to have an experienced comedy musicians involved. Let's Talk About Me feels like a f***ing nostalgia critic sketch. It's bad at being bad on purpose. The irony is intentional and the jokes don't land, so it's not a delicious irony, so it's not funny. The song is severely cut down in the film, and even if the song sucks, every verse should have been included. Thankfully or unthankfully, the full song is on the soundtrack. Not a good song, but provides a villain motivation that could have bettered the narrative. It was probably Disney excluding it Christmas Carol style because it's not about Muppets and they think kids are stupid. But the good songs, however, are f***ing 
fucking amazing. Man or Muppets won an Academy Award for Best Original Song. It is the most ridiculously overdramatic song I've ever heard, perfectly combining the heart and humor, better than any other Muppet song that tries to do both. Typically, they're sad songs and funny songs, this is both perfectly. However, it only had one competitor, Real in Rio from Rio. Uh, yeah, remember Rio? The song is amazing, but there was no competition, but the song is amazing. Pictures in my head and the reprise of Rainbow Connection capturing the heart of the movie. Including Rainbow Connection in this movie could have come off as nostalgia bait pandering, and it's a risk that pays off because it's shockingly used incredibly sparingly. It works great as an alternative version, a Piggy Kermit version, a duet version, a Steve Whitmire version, but succeeds narratively with the attempt at the Muppet Telephone being an attempt for a reunion. It makes sense to do something familiar on top of concluding Animal's character arc in the film, which which is very nicely wrapped up. Animal getting an identity crisis subplot, which is a perfect little sh** post arc for a sh** post character. I love how it satirizes much of the children's entertainment garbage of the 2000s. And this came out in 2011, so we are still kind of in the era of sh** like Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Squeakwool type kids movies, you know, just lazy garbage banking on nostalgia. This entire movie could have been nostalgia bait garbage, but it's not. It's genuinely good fan service, and it's especially better than any right than it had to be. It's not a very technically impressive movie. Some of the effects aren't impressive at all and look like complete shit. At the end of the day, it is a 2010s Disney movie. It's not poorly shot in general, but there's none of that, like, grit or technical wizardry like previous movies. It's not perfect, but the highs are ridiculously high, and that true effort to revive the franchise was very apparent. It actually feels like the effort that the boss would have wanted. The film was a huge hit, but who didn't like it? Frank Oz. Oz in the 2010s onward has been very publicly critical of the current state of both the Muppets and Sesame Street. Not long after this movie, Oz would make his last guest puppeteer appearance on Sesame Street in season 43 in 2013. I have something exciting to tell you! Oz's statement on 2011 included, I thought there was some wonderful things in it, but in general, I started to vomit when things get over-sentimental and sweet. It's all because Disney doesn't understand purity. And if he's referring to the ending being a little too happy-go-lucky, then I agree. I don't think 2011 suffered from a lack of Manhattan-like realism throughout. There's enough honesty, the ending just sucks ass. Speaking of ending and sucking ass, why the f is there a Cars 2 poster in the background? The film was a huge hit, the biggest box office hit for the Muppets. It was quadruple the budget, although not accounting for inflation. After its theatrical run, it apparently sold over 500,000 DVDs in 2012. I think the trio of Jason Segal, Nicholas Stoller, and James Bobin were great bosses of the franchise. A Henson substitute is integral for any Muppet project, and that trio filled the Jimmy Choo. The Muppets were f back. However, in 2013, something took the family entertainment world by storm. Snowstorm. Frozen. The first Frozen made 1.2 billion, and as somebody who was in elementary school when it came out, it was a huge deal. Due to Frozen's heavy marketing and success, it arguably overshadowed the next Muppet project, which released five months after Frozen. Muppets Most Wanted was greenlit shortly after 2011's success as an official sequel, the original title being The Muppets Again. In fact, it's referenced in the film. It's the Muppets Again! But again, that is a really unspecific title to follow, a flaw with the previous. Muppets Most Wanted being a much better name because it's actually f***ing distinguishable. Much of the crew returned for the follow-up besides Jason Segal, stating that it was his mission to revive the franchise, and he succeeded with his mission. After all, he is an actor first, and he didn't do everything. So the Muppets were seemingly in good hands of Nicholas Stoller and James Bobin. Despite being acknowledged as a direct sequel, it really isn't which isn't really an issue from a narrative perspective. The movie isn't about Gary and Walter's relationship and takes a similar direction to Great Caper and Treasure Island of a pure comedy sequel. Although Walter is still a prominent character, so there's one consistency between the two films. And the plot does take advantage of the Muppets re-rise to stardom at the end of the movie. A plot point that fortunately parallels what actually happened in real life. The show within a show movie element is also retained with the Muppets performing old school Muppet shows live 
alive and done well once again. The direction also being similar to Great Caper with its heist elements and genre bending and subversion of cliches. Being a doppelganger story with spy elements and a comedic musical. In fact, it's kind of like Cars 2, being a sequel with a world tour and familiar characters and spy elements, but not dog sh and logical as a direction. It's not perfect and it's not better than its predecessor, but I've noticed that it is a movie that is divisive amongst fans, much like Manhattan, and I think is far over hated. I agree with many of the common criticisms against the movie, but I don't think they're as detrimental to the quality and my overall enjoyment. As a pure comedy, it is one of the funniest, the humor easily being its greatest strength. It does not take any risks for its story, however, and I understand much of the disappointment surrounding this movie. Given the flaws of both it's kind of a pick your poison situation. Not making a doppelganger plot heartfelt was a good decision because the characters have to be a little stupid to realize that Kermit has been replaced by Constantine, the world's most dangerous frog. Constantine easily being the most memorable villain in Muppet history. Not so fast. Where's Kermit? What do you want? You have walked your last walker, bear. A fellow Muppet is rarely the antagonist of Muppet content. Conflicts, you know, like, besides, like, f***ing stupid-ass Wizard of Oz off the top of my head. Constantine was performed by Matt Vogel, and his performance is perfectly off. The amount of work put into Constantine's Kermit impression getting better as he impersonates him is a commendable and constant evolution. The little details like him thinking it's Sesame Street and getting the characters' names wrong, plus his puns are just really funny references. The way that Sam Eagle is incorporated as an anti-hero police officer is a really clever way of making a familiar character an obstacle in the plot given his pre-existing disapproval of the Muppet shenanigans. The soundtrack was only written by half of the Flight of the Concords, Brett McKenzie. The songs here are more consistent in quality even if there is less narrative risk to build around. There is one attempt at a dramatic number, Something So Right, which is a great song but does provide a slight tonal inconsistency. However, we're doing a sequel and the interrogation song are comedic masterpieces communicating the spirit of the bosses and Jerry Jewell's vision perfectly. We're doing a sequel being a perfectly meta number mocking Hollywood and its absurd sequels despite being one. In the process, foreshadowing the atrocious film and concept that is Toy Story 4. Roasting The Godfather 3, the plot of the movie only being half decent. Acknowledging that it's the eighth movie, it's perfectly meta, logical, and hilarious. The half decent plot part is unintentionally true, as I do think the actual cracking of the case discovering Kermit's been replaced doesn't get enough focus. The interrogation song excellently translates the previous events of the movie with bickering between the officers with rhyme schemes that are clever. It's a lyrical wonder how it was structured coherently and relevantly and not have a forced rhyme scheme. It's shot like an actual interrogation too, which is a funny combination with the absurd imagery of the Muppets. The technical quality is still inferior to its predecessors. Given that it is an action plot, there is a lot more effects and once again, not great, still a 2010's Disney movie. But hey, Constantine has a gun. Muppets with guns are based. It also has Diddy. The film has an extended version, but the theatrical version is only 107 minutes long, but the extended is 119 7 minutes long. Like, what's the f point of a 12-minute extended version. To sell DVDs? Probably. It's it's not really an extended version, it's the actual filmmaker's vision version. The no Disney corporate meddling cut. Almost two hours is a pretty reasonable runtime. I know children do have short attention spans at the end of the day, but two hours? If you can get the extended version, it's better because there's more jokes and a little less of a breakneck pace. It's not on Disney Plus currently. The interrogation song, the funniest f part of the movie is entirely cut down by an entire Gonzo verse? Like, why remove an entire verse of the song? But no, the extended movie version isn't even the full song either. On the soundtrack version, the Swedish chef's interrogation goes on for longer and it's hilarious. So the pointless extended edition doesn't even have the full song numbers. What the f***? If Disney could do it in 92, they could do it in 14. The film has some serious flaws. I get why people tend to dislike it, but I think the Muppets were done an effortful justice once again. However, the movie bombed, which was unfortunate because it was a worthy successor, but it was apparent that the Muppets' brief renaissance was over. It was arguably overshadowed as a family movie since it came out three days after Frozen's DVD release, as well as the unexpected hit of the Lego movie had just come out prior. Ready for this? 
Oh no! They were ready for that! It also just wasn't as good, even if I do defend the movie. This is what the evil Kermit meme originated from, and I don't blame you if you didn't know that. And the right hands James Bobin and Nicholas Stoller were never involved with the Muppets again, although James Bobin claimed he wanted to revive the original Muppet show. I imagine Disney didn't trust them since they failed financially. So where do they go? Back to DVD hell. Well, not quite yet, but back to TV. In another TV show, but not the revival of the classic James Bobin wanted, just with a show titled... The, the Muppets? What a sh title, fitting because this show is a steaming pile of sh Well, if you put somebody in charge of the characters that has zero understanding of the characters, it's a death sentence since it's such a character-oriented intellectual property. So who was the boss this time? Bill Prady and Bob Cushel. Bill Prady actually being experienced with the Muppets since he worked on the Muppet Celebrate Jim Henson, the Fraggle Rock animated series, the Jim Henson Hour, Muppet Classic Theater, Muppet Vision 3D, the Muppet Interactive Video Cassettes, and Muppet Sing Along Billy Bunny's Animal Songs. I'm the Earl of Eating and it bears repeating that the food has better beware. When my mouth is drooling, hey, this ain't no food. I'm a very, very hungry young bear. So a very Muppety resume, but not a great Muppet resume. And on top of that, the executive producer of The Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon, uh, ruh -ruh. The other creator, Bob Cushell, being an executive producer on a bunch of sitcoms I've never heard of, excluding Malcolm in the Middle and American Dad. So you wanna know why this show sucks? Bazinga! The Muppets 2015 took an approach of a mockumentary sitcom style, which was a popular format in the mid-2000s to the mid-2010s. The show is being structured to document the lives of our fictional characters. This includes being shot with lots of shaky cam and having interviews mid-absurdist scenario. It's kind of a divisive subgenre of show, however, I think that could be attributed to the jokes of the popular shows and not really the format. I've really only heard people say The Office isn't funny and never The Office has a bad format, which is a completely different criticism. I do like Parks and Recreation and The Office. They aren't perfect shows, contrary to what every cracker at your local Starbucks will tell you. The Office especially I have gripes with. I understand completely why people hate them entirely. Modern Family, also of the genre, I think is dog sh I am super nostalgic for Total Drama, an animated spin on the format, but it's dog sh here, the Muppets are both poorly written and inserted into a scenario that is distractingly realistic. One of the main events of the series that was included throughout its marketing was that Kermit and Miss Piggy broke up off-screen. Get your hands off of me! It's a little too late to show that you care now, don't you think? Oh, You're I, the I, one that broke up with me, well, remember? I know, I know, that, that's true. We are true. through, Finito! I have moved on! Okay, well, uh, so shall we take it again from the top? No, we are not starting over. We are through! Done! Over! A complete opposite to the will-they-won't-they they dynamic audiences are used to, with Kermit having a new love interest, another pig named Denise, making it more of a will-they-won't-they they get back together. A heavy emphasis on sitcom-y romance being a recurring type of conflict throughout the series. Romance that the audience is intended to be deeply invested in, given its concept. Featuring lots of bizarre Muppet-human relationship conflicts and relationship conflicts between familiar characters. The Muppets' lives after work being one of the main selling points of the show, including their sex lives. One of the main romance conflicts being that Sam Eagle wants to fuck Janice now for all you Samus shippers. Yeah, yeah, I guess the all-American patriot wants to fuck the hippie. Much of the character's traits are incredibly flanderized to the absolute worst, but not really in an obnoxious way, but it's clearly done to fulfill the 22-minute runtime. Fozzie is no longer innocent, and he's just a complete fucking dumbass, and he's incredibly unlikable. There is no childlike innocence to his character. Sorry, kids. Santa's too sad to do the show tonight. Instead, he's gonna try to figure out what the last three months of his life meant. <laughs> <laughs> the dry realism, even more realistic than Manhattan, is an incredibly questionable approach. I guess they listen to Frank Oz's criticisms of 2011 too much. And the show has no clear demographic. It's rated TV PG. There are instances of hell and damn. The characters often drink. But despite taking a more grounded approach to romance, they, like, they don't f*** or anything, because it's it's still a child-appropriate show, but it's, it's a wee bit edgier. <laughs> Boy toy. Trust me, Scooter, you 
Bada boy toy. But like, who is this show for? Now, of course, its intention is to replicate the boss's vision of the Muppets being for adults, a motive that's shifted by better having significant adult appeal through absurdist dialogue and whatnot. <laughs> Yep, me too. Are we in the right theater? <laughs> With some colorful characters and absurdist slapstick for the children. Like, they work as adults realistically. Seeing them with smartphones and drink constantly is cursed. There is the occasional good joke, however, like the Swedish chef singing Rapper's Delight. <laughs> The celebrity appearances are weak, with the exception of Jack White, who does a great rendition of Stevie Wonder's You Are the Sunshine of My Life. Walter is noticeably missing, and I don't know if that was a purposeful exclusion. That could be attributed to Walter's performer, Peter Linz, not really being involved with the Muppets at the time besides Walter. But Walter being missing is a perfect allegory for the dip in quality between Most Wanted and 2015. The series was incredibly poorly received with one season because it was an insulting pile of shit. and there was one person who was particularly critical of it. Not Frank Oz, but Steve Whitmire. Steve Whitmire apparently gave notes to the writing and directing staff of Muppets 2015, which the higher-ups disapproved of any criticism. And usually the only drama that we see with the Muppets is between Kermit and Miss Piggy, but the man who was given the voice to Kermit for decades has been fired by the Muppets studio, leaving the character's fate hanging in the balance this morning. The last original cast member next to Dave Goles. Jim Henson's fan turned apprentice. The man that voiced Kermit for 27 years was fired for criticizing the creative direction of characters he knew fondly. Criticisms that Steve Whitmire gave were absolutely justifiable because the Muppets had once again lost their identity. Disney declaring Whitmire's criticism as an act of unacceptable business conduct. He badmouthed Disney and Disney didn't want to risk losing money. And with the insulting firing of Steve Whitmire, Kermit the Frog himself would lose his identity and spirit harder than any other Muppet. Steve Whitmire did not have an apprentice, given that he couldn't play Kermit forever. Nobody was lined up after him to play Kermit, given his inevitable death or retirement. But the boss's death was unexpected, and they found the right person to fill his roles. And especially the right person, Steve Whitmire, to fulfill his practical alter ego, even if his spin on the character wasn't perfect. What a good song. I knew you guys could do the tribute for Jim. I bet Dave Goles watched this in horror and could do nothing about it. And knowing that he couldn't question any authority given that he'd be out of a job and would further increase the loss of the Muppets' spirit and identity. But Kermit the Frog is too integral to the brand to exclude, unlike Rolf or Scooter. So, who is going to play Kermit? Well, Matt Vogel was cast into Kermit. Matt Vogel was another fan-turned-apprentice. He was the apprentice of both Jerry Nelson and Carol Spinney, playing a ton of minor roles on Sesame Street as early as 1996, but would eventually take over for Big Bird, Floyd Pepper, Uncle Deadly, Crazy Harry, Lou Zealand, Robin the Frog, Sweetums, and would play Constantine in Most Wanted. So the guy known for playing Jerry Nelson characters and not Jim Henson characters took over as Kermit. Matt Vogel's first appearance of Kermit being on these Lazy Muppet Thought of the Week videos I mentioned earlier. It's not that easy. Being stuck on a conveyor belt. See what I mean? And he sounds like fucking shit. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? In fact, he sounds like Constantine because it is Constantine. But why make the doppelganger Kermit actual Kermit? His voice is way too deep. Vogel isn't bad at Jerry Nelson impersonations. And I've been pretty tolerant of the voices changing throughout the chronology. But Vogel as Kermit is incredibly distracting and inaccurate. Vogel is not a bad performer at all. Some of his vocal impressions are great, especially Floyd Pepper. But he was not fit for Kermit. Admittably, over his 27-year run, Steve Whitmire's voice did get deeper from inevitably aging, which happens a lot for people who play characters for decades. Yes, Mr. Scrooge? Who is this? It's Mr. Applegate, sir. He's here to speak to you about his mortgage. Please, Mr. Sir, listen, uh, relax, uh, relax. Uh, we talked about uh, overreacting uh, to things. It's a code red. Ah, code red! Oh my god! Whitmire's aging is noticeable in his last appearances, but it wasn't this distractingly deep. All the inflection and stuff was still there. 
Hi ho 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 there! Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays! And if they couldn't get a new younger person to voice Kermit, and got a familiar cast member to voice Kermit, Peter Linz would have been a good option since he took over for Ernie in 2017. Now first of course you are going to need... your rubber ducky! <laughs> like, why couldn't they just get current Ernie to play the new Kermit? Walter was gone at this point, it's not like he'd be busy with him. This is especially odd because Kermit is a very popular character to impersonate. Hmm. Love you too. Love you. Got something for you. No. In the year 2024, he probably has more street cred in meme culture than in pop culture. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. <laughs> Mine. I have a reason to believe that Kermit parody videos are more popular than actual Muppet projects from their entire history in 2024. There's this channel called Are You Super Serial, which has more subscribers than the actual Muppet channel. It's like Super Mario Logan, but with Muppets, and I think it's safe to say that there is going to be an entire generation of kids that don't know that Kermit isn't a degenerate character. I don't want to get out of your room. Yo, bro, call your mom for Valentine's Day. Why, Kermit? I don't want to. I don't care. Nobody cares about stuff on Valentine's Day. I need a date. Nobody I want, cares. I want to get laid. Shit, I bet Gen Alpha has seen more Kermit hangs himself videos than actual Muppet videos. Like, how is Kermit's voice in parody videos where he hangs himself better than the actual Kermit's voice? Mad Vogel's Kermit would debut in 2017, but most people would not find out about his voice until 2020. Jesus. You know what, Tetchy? One of the greatest proofs of God's existence is answers to prayer. Isn't that wonderful? Proof that God is there. He answers our prayers. I like to pray. Well, do you like to play? I like to pray. Yes, I know you do, honey. But do you like to play, too? Play? Yes, play. Do you know...